Welcome to Creativity in the Classroom. My name is Linda Keen, and I'm speaking from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am director of Next.cc eLearning Designopedia that we will share with you during the session. I'm also an architect, which means I design spaces and environments and buildings, and I am professor of architecture and environmental design um, at the School of Chicago. And I'm really excited to welcome all of you uh, from wherever you are, and I think we're going to have a map here um, in a minute. We first want to thank our sponsors and supported, certainly the Learning Revolution Project, Blackboard Collaborate that we're all working on, um, any I, Internet of Things broadband for seniors, the Australia E-Series, and Adult Learning Australia. So thank you, and also thank you to Coach Carol, Vanessa Crouch, and our, our co-moderator today as well. So I'm going to start by clicking and then dragging. Um, I am right here uh, on Lake Michigan. So it's about 5 o'clock early, uh, early pre-dinner, and I see that we have people in Australia, which is really great, and someone in California. Oh my gosh, people in the U.S. That's excellent. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Um, today's session is about creativity, and it is about creativity in the classroom. Now, we all have been hearing a lot about the fact that creativity and innovation matter in today's global economy. Yet we know that the diversity of human creativity is lost when students drop out of school or disengage from feeling that they are creative. Design as a process connects traditional subjects with real practices and stimulates individual creativity with the idea of possibilities. Creativity delivers motivation and passion with productivity. I am going to show you, uh, we do several different workshops about creativity uh, in the classroom, on the school campus, and in the school community. This is the youngest one uh, we have ever done, and it was with a group of third graders. They had graduated. It was done last summer as part of the Learn X uh, design the third International Learn X Design Conference, which was held in Chicago at the School of the Art Institute. The first one being held in Paris um, in 2011, the second in Stockholm, I think, in 2013. So here we are on a summer's day, 9.30 on a Monday morning, and they arrive with their shorts on and <laughs> ready to wonder what's going to happen. I did not know these children, and it was really an experiment in shifting from directed instruction to really student-led inquiry in a short period of time. So here we are, we're setting up. There were actually uh, nine students in total. The woman with the uh, camera is a recent graduate from the School of the Art Institute, so we had two um, architect and interior architect mentors, a mother, and then also a practicing interior architect plus myself in this experiment. So our first question to the students was, what is creativity? Now this is a little bit of a deep question, and basically for those of us who aren't only in third grade now, we know that if we're educators that people are born to learn and that they're born to create, and they're actually born designers. And if you've seen some wonderful neuroscience videos, our brains, through 7 million years and 350,000 generations, are wired with over 100 billion neurons set to learn 24 hours a day. With access to everything known before online, e-learning is a huge support to student learning and teacher learning. Inside those children's heads, we now know that there's a repository of everything human. The skills that have developed, the music, writing, dance, art, and stories that have been told. Now what is really key about this is that all is ready to be awakened in imagination. But now scientists are learning that parts of the brain lie waiting to be triggered at certain stages of life. 
And if certain events don't trigger the imagination, then much of the potential to awaken it disappears or atrophies. So we are looking at the classroom as it is and thinking about how children learn before they come to school. And this we call informal learning or that tacit knowledge that each of us brings to light by who we are, the talents we have, the interests, the people we know, and the places we visit. So to support the work that you're going to see, the hands-on project-based investigation, we have created an e-learning website called next.cc, which has a lot of journeys with over, a thousand, <laughs> over 5,000 activities that are then linked to careers and virtual field trips and museum interactives. So let's all be thinking, what is creativity? And let's get started. An easy question for kids is, how are we creative? Now, I don't know if any of you are creative types or in the creative industry. Certainly, teachers are creative. <clears throat> but with kids, it's easy to introduce the five senses or six senses and talk about how the sense of touch, sight, hearing, tasting, they all laughed at the tasting <laughs> and touching, all help us be creative. So the first thing they did was to trace their hand. And I showed that great um, data image of the all hearing, seeing, feeling, tasting hand. So they get to put their earlobes on their fingertips. And we're looking there. You can see the uh, image up above, which is kind of scary. And we're talking about how we learn and how we can be creative. This slide shows a very simple exercise about your cone of vision. So they put their arms out until they can't see their fingers. And normally, good peripheral vision, which matures at 18 years, is about 180 degrees. I'm older than these children, so you can see my hands are tipped in. The second one, then, is um, both the top and bottom vision for your cone, where you can stop seeing your fingers with your top and bottom. And so then by taking this cone of vision, we can walk around and look at where we are. And in doing that, we can actually see things that we might be able to improve or change with that cone of vision. So that was kind of getting their jigglies out. And then we asked, who is creative? So I'd like to ask you, who do you think is creative? And if you could either type in using the text bar here um, on the whiteboard, or you can type it in the chat room. Who is creative? We get a lot of good scientists, um, artists, and I'm glad you say teachers. That's excellent. Writers, definitely. This is where you start thinking, wow, actually a lot of people who do a lot of things that I know are actually creative. I think actually parents are very creative, too. <laughs> raising their children. And I guess if we do that, then the truth of the matter is, is that imagination really knows no age level or creed or income or race or ethnic background. Um, but it really belongs to all of us. OK, so this is excellent. And after who is creative, a question is, how are we creative? So I think somebody who said writing, it could be a writer. We could, writing is creative. Painting is creative. Uh, modeling, making. Uh, sometimes speculating can be creative. Um, <clears throat> proposing. They said, well, imagining, when you imagine. And they talked a lot about ideas. Storytelling, that's a good one. <coughs> uh, 
pardon me, and then an easy question, what do we create? So what do people create? And this is pretty amazing because they realized in looking around that everything that they saw, people created. Oh, dreams is very good. We have the philosopher and the metaphysicist here. <laughs> so the idea in these series of quick questions, and you can see it didn't take us long um, to really talk about them, um, is that we want to begin to build value in the importance of using your imagination and being creative to kind of counter the fact that it's not just um, artists who are creative, that it can be a musician, it can be an environmentalist, that a lot of people are, we create, I meant to say music, <laughs> we create all kinds of things and that it's actually us trying to make these things that really changes um, how we think about what we're, our purpose is in the world and then how we might contribute. So these are all excellent ideas. So first of all, I asked them how many of them knew a designer. So raise your hand in the conversation if you know a designer. And let's see, I know a designer, so I'm going to raise my hand. Good. Coach Carol knows one. Um, good. <clears throat> All right. How many of you can name a famous designer? That gets a little harder because a lot of people don't think of designers as people who have actually contributed to the world. Like who invent, people think, well, let's see, <clears throat> who invented the light bulb? A lot of people know that from school. Who invented asphalt for our highway systems? Who thought of paving the road? It goes on and on. Anyway, I thought I'd introduce them to some young designers. And this one is a three minute video and we have a lot to cover. So. Um, if you want, um, I think that the, um, here we go, this is this one right here. I'm going to copy this into yours if you want. It should take you to the video, and you can meet some, um, there you go. Oops, I think I have to put it in here. There you go. Um, you can click on that and you'll, it's very interesting because it talks about, college students are talking about why they got interested in design and what they like about it and what they want to design, trying to stimulate the students' ideas about what they might want to do. If you're going to uh, watch it, please raise your hand and then I know that you've got it. <clears throat> okay, great, Joffrey, good. And everyone might not be able to watch it, so I'm going to just, we'll wait just a couple more, maybe, 35 seconds or 45 seconds. <clears throat> okay, good. You got it too. This is mostly linked for you to use as a resource should you want to follow this series of activities one day in your classroom.
Okay. I'm going to move on. You can finish watching that. that should, it should be just about ending, I think. <clears throat> um, on next, uh, so you see there are many design interviews of architects, industrial designers, fashion designers, talking about how they got into their careers. <clears throat> and then down below, it says design fields, and we are starting to interview students who are in high school or in middle school talking about what they want to design. So it begins to warm up the conversation about what design creativity delivers and who does it. We're going to skip this one, but um, I'm going to have, uh, I can paste the, this is a 30 second video, but it really just talks about how everything around us is designed and that actually um, if you start to realize that, you will realize that it's important to be involved in it. We're going to skip that one, but you'll have that link for later on. <clears throat> so this is what the kids came up with, just like you did. So you can see some of the same things. We forgot computers on our list. And we also looked at both kind of functional things, um, cultural, they begin to understand that actually imagination contributes to culture and really builds a lot of things that um, we have valued and continued in our um, culture. So then we asked them to really start thinking about where they feel creative and what they might want to create. Because this is starting to think, do I need a special place to put my creativity cap on. And you can see this wonderful child every day, every time of day, every season, and every month he feels creative. Some feel creative in their rooms, in their houses. You can see some of the things that they want to design. So the first thing that we did was say, all right, I think we're warmed up. We know what we do to create things. We know we've got some ideas. So they're going to make their creativity cap. They're going to get right into making. And these uh, hats were actually from Fad Fest in Barcelona. It's a series of design festivals that moves around different cities, very much like the uh, Biennales, that really share contemporary design ideas. So here they are. They've made their hats. And uh, they're standing, they're in Chicago, and we went around and they told us what they wanted to design. So some of the things that you saw earlier, they wanted to design a time machine. I'll go left to right. We are just getting this video of them. It's precious and priceless. This young man wants to make houses. He wants to make a video, a roller coaster, a video game, a time machine some kind of clock. This young man wants to make public toilets. He wants to make a bridge, a city, a building. So really lots of different ideas. And you can see some of the equipment that we brought in. And then we wanted to really start to shift towards the classroom and find out where they would feel creative. Now, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but if you have any questions, please type it in the conversation room, and we will um, right away talk about it a little further. But where do you feel creative? And this is after they declared it was their bedroom or their library or whatever. They were given access to a lot of different materials, and they each were given about a half an hour to build a space where they felt creative. And I wish I had, could share the videos of them presenting, because then they presented these. This is a space that is warm. And these are two, I'm afraid the muffin tins became very popular hot tubs <laughs> where they could get warm. And of course, they had nature and trees. So this one's more of a tree house. This student then actually loved the idea of texture on the floor and had two different places, one where he, a clubhouse he could bring his friends, 
it had a lot of antennas, so it was wireless. <laughs> and then the other was kind of his meditation room. This was a series of objects that uh, one of the boys made to invite his family in. And these were kind of uh, nesting, kind of like seed nesters where people could crawl in and be really, really comfortable. So you can see uninhibited, without any restraints, they're building a lot of different um, ideas and options and embedding what they're making, embedding the forms with ideas. This was perhaps the most spectacular. Um, it was actually a drop-down desk because she said she felt most creative when she had things to um, draw with. And the key thing was is that she said that one of the problems, because we had started to talk about they were going to redesign their classroom, was that the desks take up too much space and then they can't be moved around. So here she is. She has all of her ideas. It can then fold up. She was wearing it on her body with a belt. I really think it's perfect for a Kickstarter. She's, I think, barely in first grade. <laughs> so anyway, we have all of the creative juices flowing, and here we are. We are taking a close look at the picture of their third grade classroom, which is very typical of classrooms all over America. It's about 25 feet by 30 feet. It might, this one looks like it actually has larger windows that look out into greenery, which is really, really nice. And it has a few areas. You can see um, the kind of science lab over here, the teacher's desk, some collaborative desks, and then a lot of the typical um, posters and signs that are up for what they're learning. Well, just wait till you hear what the kids' ideas were. So we asked them what they liked about the room and what they thought could be improved. And they said right away, I don't know if you missed it, and the, they were at the Art Institute in a classroom, and they said, wheels on chairs would be amazing because they can move around and go back and forth. And of course, you know, part of the mandate in this type of classroom with the desks and the chairs not on wheels is so that students will focus and pay attention. Anyway, but we're learning more and more now that movement actually helps us focus. So we came up with some ideas that maybe would be needed that weren't necessarily in that classroom in addition to new furniture. So they wanted spaces where they could come up with new ideas, where they could then, we talked about how you share ideas, and we demonstrated with them the difference between talking about an idea, talking and showing that idea, talking and modeling, and explaining the idea, which then gets into the fabrication space and the presenting space, and they got it. And so we looked at, how do we dream and improve? And we introduced, Next actually has the design thinking, design research, design making, and design process journeys. Um, I'll give you the design, um, I think it's this one. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, this is a link. Um, to a design process movie. It's very short. You can take a quick look at it. It's only 30 seconds long, so raise your hand if you'll take a look at it. Great, thank you. The exciting thing about the design process is that it assimilates next generation science standards, particularly in the way engineers work, where they actually prototype, model, test, and reflect and evaluate. And so this is what we explained with the students that it was time for us to try to do. So after they had individually worked, we talk to them about how they would go about transforming that room with new ideas. 
So we looked at the ways that architects and designers and artists work. And we talked about building different forms and showed them that these were all study models made out of paper and light wood that actually created these warming shelters, which were little individualized places to get out of the wind. And this allowed people to um, sit together and have a conversation, get warm. They were heated by those lamp sources. This was a place just made out of folded cardboard. It's actually a shelter for a shelter of uh, homeless people, but it actually could be a way, a, a way out of the way place to have a reading break. And it's really easy to do. There's all, we actually have several journeys on folding and origami and paper engineering. These are easy to make with everyday cardboard and tape. Here's a larger one that kind of moves out of the classroom. It's made out of um, fabric with a bit of uh, foam. It uh, could be made out of styrofoam. It could be made out of um, a light frame or polycarbonate. All kinds of easy things that materials can do. This one's actually made out of concrete, but it could definitely be made out of foil and cardboard in the classroom. It's actually a bus stop, which is pretty amazing. <clears throat> And, of course, the idea of a space that could be invisible and hidden, like the cloak of invisibility, so we could conceal spaces within their classroom. And we gave them some ideas. <clears throat> we had a lot of pieces of things that they could put together. And sometimes that the material you had then prescribed how it would be best put together. So these examples are meant to be shown quickly. Many of them were, pardon me, very familiar with the stacking model. And we showed them contemporary spaces made with the same things that they did when they were children. And again, most of these are made out of cardboard and very light material. So they went back and thought about, reevaluated their individual spaces, and in groups at their table talked about what they liked but they thought might be able to be transformed <clears throat> from their imaginary space into the classroom. And from that, we asked them to consider getting into three different teams. Because when one looks, when an interior architect or interior designer looks at space, this is what they do. They look up. <clears throat> so we said, what? Lay on the floor. We told them when they came in, you can lay on the floor and we're going to be standing on our desks in this uh, workshop. So get on the floor and look up. And what do you want to see on the ceiling? And why? So we talked a lot about what people have on their ceilings and then showed them some amazing things like the textures of Tara Donovan made out of styrofoam cups. We actually gave them pictures of people lying on the floor, which made them giggle, and they thought this was wonderful. And they thought, it would be so great if I could just lie down in class sometimes. And then we looked at how other people activate the ground space. This one, by now, people are talking out loud when we're showing them, and they're thinking, they see the flexible furnishings. They see that a hard space became a soft and individual and flexible space just through pattern. And then we talked about the surround or around. And that's where they, of course, the idea that every wall is to be drawn upon is a dream of every child. And we looked at white walls, which now are basically in a blackboard format. But we know you can paint walls to be completely the whole wall as a chalkboard. Or you can have white walls now. We looked at the idea of different types of furnishings. Most schools order from institutional school um, companies because they have a warranty and they're indestructible to some degree. <clears throat> but in many ways, are they, if we ask, the most efficient model in terms of uh, flexibility and maneuverability? And we're in a stage where we're really rethinking how people collaborate. And maybe all the desks, since they take up so much, should just be one big table and everybody scoots in. 
Um, so here's one at the Focus Center. And it just gives you an idea. These are all artists working or designers fabricating these things. And then we actually talked a lot about storage in the room because we know that storage in the room is a huge issue. Yes, some of them are not so comfortable, but it gives you an idea that maybe they could think of something different. This one's a little more comfortable. <clears throat> and it kind of brings in the idea of your individual house and the softness. You can see that there is sound attenuation and the softness of materials. And then it's also flexible because the soft things can go in and out and be moved around. Very much starting to look at the 21st century um, interactive space. So the students were each given an hour and they picked teams. And this is the interactive floor team. And this is what they came up with in an hour. All right, this is the, same, this is the cloud room. This is the girl who made the drop-down desk. She wanted a room where she could go in to be quiet and to meditate and think, that it would be soft to sit on, soft to lay down, and it could actually be stacked on a very huge cloud bean bag. This is the plan of the room with the desks removed. I'm going to go back. If you see, this is collapsed, but we did create the typical number of desks, and we created a typical generic classroom with two doors in. This is looking down at the floor. This is where the desks are now stacked at the back of the room because this is picnic day. They love that idea where they could have a day <clears throat> spent on the floor where they would be learning on the floor and maybe during the winter where it was too cold, they could have brought their trees in and they could sit down on green carpet squares and they could have their lectures at the uh, blackboard and they could do their drawings while their body wasn't sitting but was in a lot of different kind of wiggly positions. Now the other thing that they were so proud of are these two black rectangles. These are interactive floors that the teacher would set each week so that when the child would come in, certain things would light up with vocabulary like acute and obtuse if they were studying geometry. And they would link their different subjects, science and math and art, would light up if they were going to be looking at angles, obtuse and acute, <clears throat> writing about them, if they were in, say, language arts, if they were going to do a math project, modeling with them, if they were going to do science, maybe looking at how light changes its angle when it shines based on the material um, and its reflectivity, just the different combinations so that they begin to see how one subject actually goes throughout different topics. And here they are presenting this. You can see the desks are still in there. They each spoke. This happens to be a sixth grade brother on the left, a fifth grade brother on the right, and then <clears throat> I think a first grader. They came. Their parents were attending the conference. They were amazing. They did a fabulous job. So let's move on. The next group was a two-person team, the interactive wall team. This reminds me, um, as an architect, <clears throat> I work on the national, um, or I'm part of the National American Institute of Architects Committee um, for Education Architect in Alternative Learning Spaces. And we know that learning is changing. And we know that we need different things in our classrooms, on our school grounds, and out in our school community to stimulate that learning and support that learning. I cannot believe that, I mean, it's just amazing what these third graders came up with. And I wish, we will have the videos up within the week, but this is Ashley's, and this is an interactive wall. On the right is a globe you can spin, and when you stop, you put your finger on it, and facts about that country comes up, and pictures about that country comes up, very much like History Pin now very much like Google 3D modeling. They want it 
this wall is actually, I mean, a person's about half as tall as this. So they really want it to be big. They want it to be rear projected. This can be done, you can have a touch screen. This can be Google Earth, but we just aren't linking yet Google Earth with History Pin, but it will be coming. The cotton balls are actually the soft seats. So if I am a student, I'm presenting my project on Chile, I can pull these soft seats right off the wall, they're Velcroed on, so that they don't take space up on the floor, and my group can sit around and we can, um, they can give me some feedback. Then over here on the left is the vocabulary of that week, what the teachers are going to be thinking, and they want it on a whiteboard, not so much the, the, where we print it off and then we tape it up or um, tack it onto a cork board. Okay, so this was a two-person team in an hour. This was part of it. This was the next set. These are collapsible storage walls. Starting on the left is a chalk, uh, um, corrugated board where things can be pinned up, so projects of the week or the month that students are working on. Next comes the flat screen TV, preferably more than one monitor so that they might be looking at the computer at the same time they're watching a video because their questions that they're being asked about the video are right below the video. Of course books. I love that they still like books, so we know that that one has to be 12 or 15 inches deep. All of these have a depth to them. And then the sports basket. This is a whole wall where right on your way out for recess, you grab what you want to play with. It's right there, so it's sitting there, and then this all, as a wall, collapses, so it can be a partition wall, or it can also be, um, it can be uh, self-standing. And that wasn't enough in an hour. They wanted a living wall, because they realized that they couldn't really have real trees, probably, in their um, classroom, so they wanted a living wall, because they know that 11 plants is really what you need to clean about a 100 square foot space um, to clean the air, and they want their air to be clean. The exercise wall is a wall where at least every two hours somebody could come. Oh, this, pardon me, the question is, can you repeat what you told their task was? Okay, the task was to break into three teams. One team was going to look up, one team was going to look, at the, look up at the ceiling, one team was going to look down at the floor, and the third team, which is this one, is going to be looking at the surround or what's on the walls. So it's up, around, and down. And show us your ideas for improving your classroom. So this exercise wall, look at this. It has um, weights, it has things you can push on, it has the bungee cords, I don't know how many of you have done the seven-minute workout in your classroom, but it's a stitch. It comes on the computer. You do something for 30 seconds, and you can have the whole class doing jumping jacks for 30 seconds, a wall sit, push-ups, and it gets their heartbeat going. They can laugh a lot and giggle and breathe some oxygen, and boom, they're back at the desk focusing. It's not the whole get your coat on and go out for exercise, but it's pretty good. They voted that they wanted an aquarium because the aquarium gives them something to look at that's relaxing. It's soothing to see fish swimming around to know that they're healthy. They also interact with the fish and any living thing in their classroom by having to feed them every day and so on. I know many classrooms have bunnies and um, lizards, iguanas, um, and so on, but I love that. At this age, they still have this affinity with living things and want them part of their life. And then the green screen. The kids are digitally literate. They want to be able to take videos of themselves in front of a green screen and then project it with a different background. They want to videotape their presentations. And rather than having to go down the hall to the computer lab or the recording room, they want to be able to do it quickly, spontaneously in their classroom. 
and here they are. Look at them. One hour and every architect designing schools should consult with them. And then finally, the inspirational feeling team. Each team had a mentor, an architect, or an interior designer or architect um, supporting their questioning, their kind of challenge of what they wanted. This group knew exactly what they wanted on their ceiling. They were very driven. And I'm so sorry I don't have this video of the four of them explaining why. So I'll try to do my best. First of all, they said that school sometimes is really boring and they know that they're supposed to keep attentive. So if they just had to look up and then they went, oh, and it would wake them up and they would attend. Now, one of the boys said, but actually the dragon makes me realize that life is an adventure and learning needs to be an adventure. So let's see, these guys were just fabulous. Let's see, this is what a classroom might look like from the hallway, the interactive floor, the Zen floor, the interactive um, wall with the world. You can see that dragon still somewhat peaceful, but then you get to see the flame in case you're not listening. <laughs> and to see of an idea, you can see the interactive wall over there that Actually, this workshop was three hours, and it could be broken into three separate homeroom hours or time slots where they did their whole creativity discussion and their hats one time, where they did their own space a second time, and then came up ideas for their classroom on the third time. What we're learning in learning environments is that they're blurring the boundaries between school museums, the outside, digital and physical making. And the amazing thing was these kids after they presented, they made this, then they came and presented to the LearnX design constituents on a stage in a ballroom. This was actually fourth hour. They've got their models down there. They each came up to the mic. And the woman who's at the mic was actually the videographer. And she said in her lifetime as a child, she never had an experience like this to redesign the spaces she was taught in. And she said herself, it would make a profound difference if every child who is learning in a school building would have a chance to change it, to improve it. So that's it. That's what it was. It's really simple. I hope I didn't complicate it. Um, it's all supported, if you want, with your students. Um, we have a Twitter site. You can follow us on Twitter. You um, can see it talks about us live there. We have a Facebook site where we post um, really weekly things that are important. You probably know already that the Journey North in the United States has started and the Great Science site where students can pick a hummingbird or a robin and track it. And then really it's the 250 journeys. We have journeys on collaboration, on um, imagination, on organization, on interior space. We're working on space planning, modeling, Whatever you want, if you don't find it, you can just Google next.cc in your topic. If you don't find it, please email us, and our research team will start, it takes us about 40 hours to research a topic, come up with age-appropriate activities, and then actually do the graphics and build it on the website. But we firmly believe that imagination needs nurturing, that it shouldn't wait till the middle school art room where children are understood to have self-selected that they are creative or in the musical room. But we believe that it should happen every year in some way, dealing with the classroom. The videos that we have, uh, if you saw the videos, it's actually linked to other videos we have workshops with fourth graders redesigning their asphalt playground to a nature play. We have um, 
middle school students greening their school, which is something professionals do, but if students demand it, then their administrators and school boards will be more proactive to enact it in referendums. And then finally, a biomimicry and design as nature high school workshops that show really how students get involved with rethinking what spaces could look like. So that's it in a nutshell. Oh, well, actually, <laughs> if you look on next, um, I was actually going to maybe I can um, go to my application sharing. We list all of our workshops. And we firmly believe that teachers, probably not trained as designers, need to have workshops. So here are all the kinds of workshops we give. And all the videos are in there. These are the workshops we give with teachers um, to prepare them, help them know how to assess these, if help to know how to align them with standards. Our standards are all under design and science. Let's see the design um, standards are right here. And you can see that there are art and design standards, um, environmental education standards, and of course we're working our way up to high school NGSS standards. All right. Um, not yet. The good question is, did they have the opportunity to go beyond their designs to actually building creating them? Each of these students have gone back to their schools in all the different levels I just explained. One is trying to fundraise to do the transformation of the asphalt. One is moving into a new building where they're going to apply some of the biomimicry um, that the students contributed to their floor planning. And we have to revisit them in the spring and see what their progress is. So that's the intent. And um, the more that students see that this is a possibility, and the more they share it and make posters and models about it, the more we think that it will implement change. So thank you very much. You've been a great audience. And I really um, invite you all to visit the site. And I really, really look forward. Um, the Global Education Conference, I haven't presented, though we have presented at conferences in Dubai and India, um, in Japan. We're, I don't know about this one. We're presenting at the National Art Educators Conference in Chicago next month and a lot of um, innovative school conferences. But if I get information on it, I can submit something. <laughs> and if it's online, that would be great. Anyway, I would love your feedback. Anything that you feel was missing in this presentation that would help you, um, you can email me and I can send you like a four-pager about creativity in the classroom and the resources that we used and a link if that would help you. So. Thank you very much, and transform your learning environment. Wonderful. I would really appreciate that. Um, most of the videos that I shared, all the videos I shared with you are on there, and we also have published academic papers that are coming out. Um, Steam by Design is one, and then Designing K-12 Design Education. So those look for those. They're published under press. All right. Thank you. And have a good morning in Sydney. And I'll have a good evening here in Wisconsin. And I look forward to catching all the other presentations in the next few days. Thank you, Carol, for organizing this. You're very welcome, Linda. Thank you so much for your time and your creativity today. We really appreciate it. It was a whirlwind tour. <laughs> I was really looking at the 95 <laughs> slides and thinking, oh my. <laughs> but that was really fantastic. It was.